All right, well, let's dive in. We'll do a few intros and we won't spend a lot of time on our bios. As, as I said, we'll send you the slides, but Tom uh, has been working in financial services really his entire career and has spent uh, really uh, close to half a century helping business owners keep more of their hard-earned wealth. And that's a lot of what we'll talk about during this presentation, hard-earned profit, hard-earned wealth. Here's my bio and really my risk management uh, started in the Army where I was a tank commander and a headquarters company executive officer with, uh, in charge with safety of soldiers and uh, equipment. Uh, I've been working at CSC Services for eight years uh, in captive management. We help businesses own their own insurance company. So we're honored to be talking with you all today. This is our team at CSC Services. So we've got a, a good team behind our clients working hard to help them protect their businesses and uh, hold on to their profits. And a little bit about our firm. Uh, we are a risk management firm that focuses on captive insurance. Captive insurance is simply a choice to own your own insurance company, protect your business, and captives offer a wide range of benefits from uh, improved risk management, uh, ability to control or lower insurance costs, uh, ability to reap insurance profits, uh, and then there are certainly tax benefits and asset protection benefits of owning your own insurance company. And we do specialize in the mid-market. So we work predominantly with small mid-market companies. Uh, and so we do understand the entrepreneurial business mindset that many of them have. And so a lot of our strategies are really tailored to that entrepreneurial mindset. So I'll tell you a little bit about CSC services before we start, and then uh, we'll dive into the meat of our presentation today. So as I mentioned, we help businesses own their own insurance company, and that really helps first establish asset protected loss reserves, uh, increase profit or wealth. And we do this for many of our clients by millions of dollars. And we'll talk about how we do that uh, throughout the presentation here today. Certainly lower or control insurance costs, uh, insure uninsured or underinsured risks. And boy, are we experiencing that right now with COVID-19. Many businesses uh, were not prepared for COVID-19 at all, didn't see it coming. Well, you know, COVID-19 isn't the only under, uninsured, underinsured risk. How about supply chain? How about political risk? There's a wide range of threats that businesses face that they're just not ready for. And if you pick up the news today, you'll see, you know, lawsuits against uh, commercial insurance carriers because uh, COVID-19 isn't covered on their business interruption policy. And that's largely because, you know, business interruption is usually tied to loss of property, like your, like your building getting destroyed. If there's no loss of property, then the, the carriers are arguing uh, that the policy doesn't cover COVID-19. And so um, it's going to go to the courts for a lot of businesses, but I can tell you that many of our captive owners have already filed claims for COVID-19 and had them approved uh, because their business was in fact interrupted. So that's something we'll want to speak to today. Uh, and then obviously benefit from insurance company tax treatment. So insurance companies are taxed favorably and that's a huge win. So we want to start out quickly just because we are captive managers by talking about what is a captive insurance company. A uh, captive is a real insurance company. They've been around since the 1950s. Uh, they do everything that a large insurance company does really with one exception and that is they have a limited license. They're limited to insuring a business or related businesses and related entities. Uh, now that definition of related can stretch. It can include things like multiple companies owned by a business or a holding company or a business owner. It can certainly include things like franchises, for example, uh, and we've seen it stretch uh, to franchisees, et cetera. So, um, and then there's obviously association captives and other ways that captives can provide insurance and risk management. Uh, what do captives do? Well, they do a lot of things. I mean, first of all, captives can uh, replace commercial insurance and help control or lower those costs. They can insure enterprise risks that are often uninsured or underinsured. They can, ins they can insure warranties, which creates a whole new profit center out of thin air. Uh, they can provide bonding. Uh, they can also insure employee benefits and health care or any combination of the above. So the benefits of captive ownership are seen here. And as I mentioned, we'll send the slides uh, to you if you'd like to have them, but really stronger business model, uh, improved risk management, cost control, 
and we'll show you some exciting captive programs that do just that. Asset protection, the ability to reap insurance profits and then have those profits taxed in a favorable way. So our presentation today really comes from, and I'll be glad to send you this article, by the way. Uh, uh, we published an article in CPA Practice Advisor uh, titled uh, Stop Leaving Money on the Table. Uh, and so this is an adaptation of that article. And again, I'll be glad to share it with you. So our discussion today is to help keep assets in play for clients uh, and for prospects, right? Because you wanna be a trusted advisor, someone that they can look to. And so we're gonna talk about uh, the six forces that can take assets off the table or take assets away or out of play for your clients. And so the presentation today, we'll go through all six and then we'll talk about strategies to address all six. And th these are strategies beyond captive insurance, but it probably won't surprise you that captives are one of those strategies. Okay, so the, the first strategy that, uh, I mean, the first threat that takes assets out of play for your clients is in fact commercial insurance. And right now, many of you know that we have a hardening market uh, in which insurance costs are going up. This has been driven largely by a lot of losses uh, due, to, due to hurricanes and storms and pretty large scale property damage. And so um, there is definitely a hardening market and even businesses that have low loss ratios, for example, uh, may be not get, they may not be rewarded for those low losses, right? So they're seeing their rates go up too to cover costs in this hardening market. So that is a, insurance is definitely a force that takes assets out of play. Another force that takes assets out of play uh, is an uninsured loss or having a claim denied, one or the other. So many times businesses have losses uh, and they don't have insurance for it or they file a, they file a claim and they're denied. Uh, some of these might be things like government fines, right? Very often businesses are not insured, but uh, let a government agency come in and audit your business and uh, it can result in a large fine. That can actually be insured uh, in, in a captive. Uh, cyber is a huge one. Uh, reputation risk, a very real place where businesses can lose, lose their reputation and then lose revenue. Uh, supply chain is a huge one, especially in our complex world. Uh, receivables, uh, certainly really important. And then uh, I've, I've put on here, you know, COVID, but you know, any kind of business interruption can, can take assets out of play for your clients. So that's uh, force one and force two. Force three is something that we call expense creep. Uh, and this really often happens when a business is established and has been operating for a while. And just over time, uh, the cost to run the business goes up uh, and suppliers are making really good margins on the company, but the company's been so focused on growth, they don't realize just how much money they're leaving on the table. So we'll speak to that one as well. Number four, the, the fourth force that takes assets out of play often is perks. Uh, and this is one that kind of sneaks in because it's, it's, very, you know, it's very important to keep good employees and keep them loyal to the company. Uh, we'll talk about some ways to do that that may actually cost the business or business owner less. Uh, and then another reason that you know, sometimes perks uh, may be excessive is because business, the business owner figures that they're going to pay taxes anyway. So they might as well just uh, have more perks for their employees. Uh, the fifth force that takes assets out of play is in fact taxes, no surprise. Uh, taxes typically take a, a nice chunk of profits and, and the result is the business is often left, uh, you know, somewhat hollowed out, if you will. Uh, and then another one, and this is really our final one, then we're gonna talk through some strategies for how to address these six forces is in fact tax planning. So we just talked about taxes, but uh, we, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't speak to tax planning. And I've got a, a friend of mine who is a, a CPA and he says that one of his best clients uh, every year gets a, a case of yellow fever. Uh, so um, the client is a, is a grader and uh, buys more and more equipment every year with debt, by the way. Uh, to get a section 179 uh, deduction, which is a huge deduction in taxes that year. 
but what the business is doing is piling up more and more debt that has to be paid in the future when there is no deduction to be had. So they'll have to make those payments with after-tax dollars. Uh, and in the event of a downturn, the business really doesn't have the liquidity to survive. And you know these Caterpillar tractors are beautiful, but they're much harder to offload in a recession when there's less construction happening. So no surprise there. All right, why don't we pause right here and just see if there's any, any questions so far on the six forces. I'll check out our chat room. Okay, good deal. All right, it looks like we've got no, no questions so far. So let's talk now, we, we talked about the six forces that take, um, that take assets off the table or out of play for your clients. Now let's talk about addressing those six forces, helping your clients protect assets, protect liquidity, uh, and then manage more. And then if you're an advisor who manages assets and giving you an ability to manage more assets as well. Okay, very good. So the first strategy we'll share is one known as is cost mitigation. And there are, you know, there are quite a few firms and we know many that we can introduce you to that specialize in best practices really across the United States. So there may be practices that your business owner clients are implementing that are more expensive. Uh, a, a really unusual example, but really powerful is uh, we know a cost mitigation firm that has negotiated significant utility saving rates for companies. And they just didn't even realize, I didn't think about going to their utility company and really pushing hard on cost savings. Another is actually um, tracking, as an example, the water that goes back to the water company through the sewer and, and getting, uh, because they were using so much water, by metering it, they're able to lower the cost that they're being charged for sewer because they're not sending the water back to the sewer treatment plant, as an example. Uh, so there are firms that specialize in knowing what cost of goods are. They know how to, they also can negotiate on your behalf. So very often businesses uh, find it hard to go beat up their suppliers a whole lot. But uh, if a firm knows what goods and services cost in different parts of the country, very often they can come in and negotiate on behalf of the business. And they often work contingency based. So this is a great way to control or help lower cost and can help save tens of thousands of dollars for businesses. Uh, and if you have an interest in cost mitigation, we can introduce you to specialists uh, in this area, okay? Uh, another uh, strategy that keeps assets in play is uh, qualified retirement plans. And um, you all are um, no doubt familiar with many of these and certainly can introduce your clients to them. Uh, one of the one of the better ones uh, is defined benefit or cash balance pension plans. So very often, business owners they may have a 401k. 401ks are more commonly known, but they not, they may not realize that they can actually own a pension plan uh, with a defined benefit, and that working with the right firm, they can make sure that most of that benefit goes to the owners. Uh, they do have to you know all qualified retirement plans require uh, benefits going to the employees, obviously. But uh, a well done cash balance pension plan, uh, as an example, with the right structure and the right modeling can make sure that the owners keep most of that profit. All right, let's go to another one. Um, this is a really interesting one because healthcare costs really are going up across the board. And so telemedicine has, has been widely proven to help control costs for both work comp uh, and for uh, healthcare. So it can, it can actually have a double digit impact on your uh, work comp healthcare costs. So pretty significant, especially if you have a business that relies on a lot of people or has a lot of, a lot of risk with, you know, either be it construction or other types of businesses that have a lot of operations. Um, how does it do this? Well, first it avoids unnecessary costs. So very often people go to the doctor when they don't need to, or their family members will, and being able to call in uh, and really talk to a doctor face-to-face -face or a nurse face-to-face -face often stops a very expensive visit. Um, and then it also helps keep ambulance chasers from latching on to perhaps an injured employee who is able to talk to a nurse or doctor, uh, apply immediate first aid, 
uh, and then get treated uh, and feel like the company took care of them, uh, that can make a really big difference. Uh, we know and work with, uh, it's because we manage captive insurance companies and companies are focused on saving money, we do work with and know excellent telemedicine firms and we can make some introductions there as well. Another way that businesses can really focus on keeping assets in play is, is really a commercial insurance intervention, right? So uh, pushing the, their insurance broker uh, for innovation. Um, in some cases, as a business grows and matures, it, they, they may need to really step up to uh, a more advanced broker that can bring in advanced strategies. Uh, for example, retro policies, which allow businesses to participate in some of their risk. Uh, and it's important for insurance brokers to work with their companies and help them uh, improve their loss ratio and uh, become safer, better places that, that have fewer risks. Uh, they, they become good at what they do. Certainly exploring high deductible policies often makes sense as well in this space. Okay. And then finally, and this is uh, one of the big thrusts of our discussion today, to help keep assets in play, own your own insurance company or help your clients own their own insurance company. Now, this is known as a captive insurance company. Now, the, the word captive may be a little bit misleading. Uh, I, I don't know who coined the term captive, but essentially it's like captive to your business. Uh, I prefer to think of it more like having a wingman for your business, right? So own your own insurance company uh, and have a wingman for the business. And this is a pretty common captive structure, very simple. This is the business owner or owners. Here's the business that they own or businesses. They pay premiums to their captive insurance company and transfer risk. The captive issues insurance policies back. If you just look at this simple diagram, as long as a business is able to uh, not use all its money and costs to run the insurance company or claims, you can see effectively we've created a separate profit center, right? So it's another way to think about a captive being a wingman, being a profit center, but yet it's serving the company by providing insurance. And for many of you, uh, if you work with clients, you wanna help them keep assets under management, right? Uh, or assets in play, well, captives can create that separate profit center. Uh, if you're an asset manager, it can also give you assets to manage inside that captive insurance company. We've added an exciting new strategy this year at CIC Services, uh, where in addition to uh, creating AUM and ensuring risks of a business, we've, we have a new program we call our Bundled Captive Insurance Program. And so this is the before, uh, business pays insurance premiums for their uh, commercial insurance. And that insurance, um, here we're showing carrier A, that insurance say has an A plus rating, which they probably need for their property uh, if they have a mortgage. And they probably need that rating for like their general liability. Uh, if they have contracts that require them to have a rating, but that, that insurance has a rating, it has policy limits, costs and terms. And with our bundle program, we changed the diagram a little bit. We're actually able to help that business owner still pay premiums, but notice that we're replacing carrier A with carrier B. Uh, carrier B does have an A plus rating uh, and they will match the terms, the limits and the costs of the existing insurance program. But what's really exciting is carrier B is willing to reinsure up to half of those premiums to a captive owned by the business owner. So the business owner owns the insurance company over here. With good loss controls in place every year, money left in the captive is really just extra profit for the business. Um, and so this is a very powerful way to use a captive to replace part of the commercial insurance. What's exciting about this program, though, is Carrier B will work with the insurance broker, pay them commission. So the, the insurance broker is not cut out of the deal, if you will, but they are able to participate uh, and do all the great work that they do. And, and their role is doubly important because they want to help that business owner uh, reduce claims so that a lot more money gets left in the captive, right? Uh, and so in this process, 
uh, the business owner is able to keep part of their insurance premiums, but also participate in the risk. So if there is a claim, the captive is going to pay part of that claim. Okay. So very exciting bundle program. If you have an interest in that, we'd be happy to talk with you about it in more detail. So what can a captive do? Well, this is a, a chart. Like I said, we'll send you these slides, but you can just see the captive insurance companies. And these are common coverages across a wide range of industries and coverages on the left. If you don't see an industry on here that you're working with, give us a call. I'm confident that we can find a, a captive insurance solution that'll work for you as well. And then another place that a captive can play a role. Remember I talked about telemedicine and by being really proactive, businesses can help lower their work comp and healthcare costs. Well, in the middle market, very often a captive can do multiple things. Um, and so we've talked about the bundle program and helping reduce commercial insurance costs, but a captive can also play a role in lowering a business's health insurance costs. So you see here on the left, we've got a, a typical health insurance structure with an employee funded deductible and then a commercial insurance layer, right? But what, what we can do is we can actually structure a layer here, uh, a captive insurance layer, and then put stop loss on top of it. And so very often this structure will help a business save 10 to 15% on health, on health insurance uh, because they're able to take this layer that has a lot of administrative costs baked into it and actually manage it through a captive. Uh, if you have an interest uh, in healthcare captives, typically the business needs to have 50 employees on the healthcare plan, uh, and uh, they do need to be fairly healthy uh, as a group, um, probably at least average or a little better than average. And so if you know businesses that fit that makeup, then this may be a great fit for them. All right. Remember also that one of the things that we talked about was that Businesses often have uninsured or underinsured risks, and we're, we're particularly aware of that right now. When we're working with clients and trying to help them keep assets in play, remember, one of the things that really um, destroys clients' wealth is uninsured, underinsured losses, and that's, that's really threat number two, right, uh, of our six threats. So businesses have operational risks. These are risks that are in the day-to-day -day running of the business and strategic risks. These are risks outside of the business's control. And both of these uh, can be very powerful. I'm gonna cover just a couple of them uh, here, but we could also speak to you in more detail about them. So let's think about operational risks. Uh, administrative actions would be a government agency coming in, creating costs through requirements or fines that the business hadn't counted on. Uh, believe me, that happens, especially if you've been in any kind of construction project, as an example. Uh, employment practices, getting sued by one of the employees perhaps or accused of discrimination. Receivables is a really important one. Uh, and, and this is very hard to ensure in the commercial market, if you will, because um, you know, they, they don't know uh, a lot about your customers and which ones might be at risk. And so it's very hard for, um, to get its receivables insurance, but you can do it through your own insurance company. Reputation damages can be really, really big uh, and very hard to insure commercially as well. Existing deductibles. So you, there may be some commercial insurance that, you, that you're not putting in the captive, but you have a high deductible that can come through the captive as well. Let's talk about strategic risks that are really outside of the business's control. Business interruption. I've got pandemic disease over here as well, but uh, pandemic disease can cause business interruption, so can a wide range of other things. Uh, a key contract being terminated that causes a significant loss of revenue. Subcontractor default. Um, this can create an entirely new profit center. We have construction companies that we work with that have their subs buy their sub default insurance through the captive. It creates a completely new profit center for the construction company. It's, it's just an absolutely fantastic strategy. Uh, very similar to if you sell somebody else's warranty on your product, you could start selling your own warranty through your insurance company and keep all the profit. Uh, supply chain interruption right here, really big one. And even, even more um, of a threat in a COVID-19 world, but also more of a threat 
in, in a global situation where we have really collisions with the international leaders, uh, certainly with Korea. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be out of the realm of the possible that they could, um, you know, sink a whole lot of ships out in the Pacific Ocean or do something crazy with a missile. Uh, or certainly that U.S.-China relations could deteriorate to where tariffs would be exorbitant uh, or suppliers would be cut off. So that gives you a sense uh, of operational and strategic risks, commonly uninsured, underinsured risks that, that could be covered in a captive insurance company. And this brings us to a, a really important point, which is, you know, how are captives taxed? So if you own your business and you buy insurance from your captive insurance company, or you're replacing some of your commercial insurance or some of your health insurance, or a warranty program, uh, that insurance company receives different taxation than the parent business. So let's start out by talking about how traditional captives are taxed, or these are larger captive insurance companies. So if you look at any skyline, let's say you went to uh, you know, Cincinnati or Nashville or um, almost any skyline, you'll notice probably the three biggest buildings are banks, insurance companies, and football stadiums. Uh, and the reason banks are I mean, the reason insurance companies are the big buildings and the skylines is they have the ability to receive premiums, right? And then they lost reserve. And then they're able to invest that money that has not been taxed yet. So when they lost reserve, it's based on future losses. Actuaries calculate that, regulators approve it. They're able to set that aside as lost reserves, not pay taxes on it, and then invest it and grow it. Uh, and so it creates tremendous wealth. And, and it's one of the reasons Warren Buffett uh, built a lot of his empire in insurance. And then they finally pay claims. And then when they can't justify loss reserves further, then they, then they have to essentially take them as taxes. So that's a very simplified way of thinking about taxation of insurance companies. Well, small captive insurance companies actually have the added benefit of being able to make what's known as an 831V election. It won't surprise you, I guess, that large insurance companies or large captive insurance companies are taxed under 831A. So 831B essentially says that if the insurance company receives annual premiums of 2.3 million or less, uh, then it can be taxed at a rate of 0% on its profit. So the premiums received minus the cost to run the insurance company, minus any claims paid uh, are taxed at zero. And this helps small insurance companies accumulate reserves to protect the business. And uh, I always like to emphasize that Congress wanted businesses to be able to do this. That's why they passed this law in 1986. This has been around 34 years. Uh, and even today in a COVID world, um, the ability to have those lost reserves is very, very important. And it helps protect the businesses that create most of the jobs in America. So that's a quick rundown on the taxation of captives. Now, Tom's gonna to step in and really talk about uh, the power of a captive and, and what it can do to help your clients keep assets in play. Had you on mute. <laughs> there you go. So, um, yeah, this is a look at a captive insurance company. And Randy, this is the captive's perspective, right? Yes. Okay, and this is a, uh, a summary of what's going on now with form, informal self-insurance. Pro very profitable business owners today, they take in um, profits, they set them aside into investments, and if something really bad happens, such as the pandemic we have, and they have to cover those costs with after-tax dollars. Another example would be that they might have to go to the bank and borrow money and then pay the bank back money with after-tax dollars. But this is an example of a business owner having $1 million of extra profits at the end of the year that are not necessarily going to have to be plowed back into the business as an expense, and they're just paying taxes on it and they're investing it. And so the after-tax amount is about 591000 and we assume in this scenario that there's $50,000 of expenses that could have been paid by a captive insurance company. It might be legal fees. It could be any variety of expenses that the captive would pay 
rather than the corporation or proprietorship or the business owner paying himself. And so they, if the business owner did that from 56 to 65, at age 65, they would have about $6.1 million accumulated that that they could use to retire on or do whatever they want. But the bottom line is, is that they've only got $6.1 million. On the other hand, they could put that million dollars a year away into a captive insurance company. And after paying administrative fees and so forth, they would have about 930. They'd have the 50,000 in claims, same over here. And that $880,000 would grow at 5% over 10 years to be $10.2 million versus the $6.1 million doing it the traditional way almost everybody does it until they learn about captives. And then the far right is doing a captive with hedging. Hedging is a proprietary strategy that we use for our captive owners if they want to participate in it. But the advantage of hedging is that the money is invested into a unique investment asset that cannot lose money. It's a colored product. It has a 0% floor. So if the market goes down, you can't lose money. On the other hand, if the market goes up 50%, you might be capped at 10, 12, or 14%. This middle section is assuming 5% internal rate of return each year, but it's straight lined. And we know that straight line doesn't really work. Um, I was t I've been working with a captive client of mine for a couple months on that for a couple months now, and he had about $30 million invested into the market. And his captive insurance company had $8 million that had accumulated in his captive. The market crashed after the pandemic stuff started and the country was went on lockdown, he lost 40% of the money that he had in the stock market. On the other hand, he didn't lose any of the $8 million that he had in his captive insurance company. And over the years, I had been pleading on him to not put all that money in the stock market, but to consider putting that money into our color product concept. Anyway, you can see here that there's 10.2 and over here, there's only 9.7. But the advantage is, is that this amount, this right-hand section cannot lose money in a down market. This one can. And so instead of really getting 5%, they're probably going to get more like an average of 2.3. And by the way, my client that I'm just refer referencing, he's averaged 8.4% per year over the last 10 years tax-free in this investment portfolio. And I can promise you he's not averaged 8.4% tax after tax in that other portfolio. In fact, now he's lost 40%, I think it is. Randy, you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. There you go. Okay. This is the same slide extended out to the client's retirement age from age 56 out to age 60. So we've put the money into the captive for 10 years. We let it accumulate, and we freeze the captive at the end of 10 years. It's not, we rescind the insurance license, but we continue the corporation, and the corporation becomes an investment company. And so these funds stay in the captive beyond 10 years. And this is how much money he can actually access after tax. But the bottom line is, is that this would generate $536,000 a year of after-tax income assuming we got 5% straight line, which we're not going to get, doing it the traditional way of just self-insuring with after-tax money only generates $467,000. But doing it with a captive, with a collared product will generate about $1 million one in retirement income after tax uh, from age, 60, age 70 rather to age 90. So, Think of the things that you can do with all this money, whether it's in a captive or not. The, what the captive allows you to do is have all this extra money that you can do additional perks, such as golden handcuffs and golden parachutes. Um, if you've got a key employee you want to provide an, an incentive to stay with you until they're 65, then you might give him ownership in your captive insurance company. You might even let him take a reduction in compensation 
and allow part of his compensation to be invested into the captive insurance company in the form of captive insurance company premiums. In addition to that, you might have a guy that's 65 and he's ready to quit, and heck, you can't afford for him to quit. He's got to stay. And so you offer him an opportunity to share in the benefits of owning the captive insurance company to stay with you until he's 70, 75. We have a uh, client that has, uh, he owns three captive insurance companies, and he had a key employee that he has helped, had allowed to participate in the captive, and he did continue to work over the last 10 years from age 65 to 75, and he just recently retired. So think of the captive insurance company of having money that you can access, but having almost twice as much money that you can access if bad stuff happens, whether it's a hurricane, a tornado, or a flood. Um, just anything can happen. You just don't know when it's going to happen, but it's probably going to happen to you during your business career. And you have almost twice as much money to access to fix stuff to owning a captive insurance company as you would have if you didn't. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Tom. And so as you think about, you know, assessing all the forces and the strategies, the first thing we want to talk about is accessibility to assets or liquidity, right? So the most liquid, most accessible assets are going to be assets or investments that have already been taxed. No surprise. Uh, and then life insurance policies. And then really in the middle, moderately liquid, or but, but still very accessible, would be captive insurance company assets and then qualified retirement plans. Uh, captive assets are actually quite accessible as long as the business owner is willing to work with the regulator that is uh, that licensed the insurance company. May have to cancel some existing policies that are in place, but the money can be ac accessed if needed. And then clearly the least liquid or least accessible wealth uh, is in equipment and real estate, right? Uh, and very often in a downturn or in a diff difficult time, that equipment may be even harder to get rid of. It may even be borderline worthless if, if no one's using it. So um, very important hey, to help. Randy, let me, yeah, dive in. Randy, so let me jump in here real quick on this liquid assets. Yes. Uh, Back back when the uh, world economy went south in 2008, 2009, et cetera, we had a lot of contractors that were clients of ours. And some, several of them had accumulated a few million dollars in their captive insurance company. And several of them had to file bankruptcy because they just were building houses and so forth. And the net result of that was, was that they were able to file bankruptcy and because the assets inside the captive insurance company were protected from creditors, they were able to turn around and get the money out of their captive to restart their business and they were back up and running within 12 months. Those people that didn't have captives, some of them never recovered. But you can, you know, in emergencies, these monies in the captive can be accessed. Very good point, very good point. So as you think about, you know, all six forces, we've made a nice handy chart here for you, uh, but when you think about the six forces that, that take assets out of play, things like cost mitigation can address cost creep and, and perks. Qualified retirement plans can address taxes as an example. Um, you know, an insurance intervention can help with commercial insurance or uninsured, underinsured losses. Uh, telemedicine can certainly help with commercial insurance costs. Uh, and then captive insurance can address really five of the six. And so very often when you're trying to help clients keep assets in play, a captive may be the very best place to start. Another thing to consider uh, is that, you know, cost mitigation may free up some, some funds that could actually be used to fill those uninsured, underinsured risks. That the business may be right here leaving on the maybe leaving exposed uh, and and face undue threats and then if you think about moving perks into the captive for key employees uh, then that can make a lot of sense as well very good let's pause here and see if we have any questions 
feel free to either put one in the chat box or you can unmute and ask. Very good, okay. So we've got um, a few cases, uh, own your own insurance company. And what we'll do is just kind of briefly highlight these uh, so that you can maybe have an idea of where a captive might be a fit. Again, we'll be glad to send you the slides. So one captive opportunity was actually a franchise operation that uh, had a lot of franchisees and they um, did home inspections, but also sold home warranties uh, to the clients. And so they were selling someone else's warranty, basically making about 10% of the warranty, decided to form their own captive insurance company and sell their own warranty, uh, which makes a huge difference. Uh, profits and warranties typically do have claims, but not an exorbitant amount of claims. Uh, so their uh, pro forma was essentially to make about 700,000 a year profit in the captive, which is a, a lot of money by selling their own warranty. Uh, here's a case of a, an oil field supply company. Uh, pretty, pretty good sized company, about a billion two in revenue. Uh, they were spending about $9 million on insurance, uh, set up their own captive insurance company, started insuring their own risks and were able to save about you know two and a half million dollars a year. A uh, trucking company with 500, 500 units operating in 48 states, uh, spending about $4 million uh, on insurance. And <laughs> by having a captive program, they are able to save about $750,000 a year, keeping assets in play. Uh, this was a, a property manager that had about $6 million in rental income. Uh, and so, they were able to insure their buildings through a captive. Actually, really, they insured a high deductible um, program and had a lot of little losses, you know, small apartment fires, little slip and fall claims. Uh, but they were able to save about 200000 a year by running their insurance through a captive insurance program. Again, that's assets in play for the owner. Uh, and then obviously that money racks up over time quite a bit. Uh, orthopedic surgery group that we worked with that uh, runs about $30 million of revenue and w actually was able to put their uh, medical malpractice insurance into a captive program, which uh, made a huge difference. Uh, they, they had low claims rates. So they did have a few losses. At one time they did operate on the wrong knee, for example, and had about a million dollar claim. But nevertheless, over the years, they built up uh, $7.4 million in 10 years, even with some of the claims that they paid out. We just had a little note in chat here. Let's see. I'm just going to stop for a second. Uh, who is the right client for a captive uh, asset and income wise? Very good question. Tom, you want to tackle that? Who's the right client for a small captive? Sure. The bottom line is it's any closely held business, business owner. Um, it works, it's a lot easier to make the sale to get them to do a captive if it is a family owned or closely held business. It can be a proprietor, it can be a corporation, S Corp, C Corp, LLC, whatever, partnership. <clears throat> um, but anybody that's making money, they just have to be able to afford to pay premiums into an insurance company. And if you think about it, who are the people that are making money? Well, generally, are, it's business owners that are paying a lot in taxes. So if they're paying a lot in taxes, they're probably doing a lot of self-insuring um, with after-tax dollars instead of self-insuring with pre-tax dollars that Congress wants you to be able to do. And so it's, it's bottom line is it's any business that's making more than – well, they need to have about 300000 or more in excess profit. So 300000 is kind of the minimum premium they need to be able to pay into a captive. Very good, very good. And uh, if you'd like to discuss that topic more, we'll be happy to jump on a separate call. We've got another question. It's my understanding a captive has to be set up similar to the parent company. How do you give ownership to a key exec that doesn't own the parent company? Good deal. Tom, you want to take that or you want me to get it? Uh, unless something's changed, I don't think that a key employee 
I don't think there's anything that disallows a key employed from having ownership in the captive. Correct. Uh, we we've done that many times over the years, and that's new to me. If it's yeah, if it's a new deal. Yeah, nothing's changed. Uh, we understand. So uh, you may be referencing in your question the Path Act, uh, and the Path Act essentially makes it um, if you're going to file the 831B election that we covered then your children or lineal descendants can't own more of the captive than the parent company. So it does exclude heirs, if you will, from owning more of the captive than the parent company, but it doesn't exclude key employees or spouses. Good, okay, good questions. I'm just gonna move the little chat box over. All right, very good. Let's keep going through our cases here. A uh, grading company, uh, 23 million revenue, 150 pieces of equipment. And um, this company was able to save about $300,000 a year uh, of insurance cost by running that through a captive, whether it was a high deductible program for their work comp and, um, and then also insuring some of their property general liability in the captive. Manufacturing company, $40 million of revenue, 120 employees, really good safety program in place. Um, they were spending about 2 million on insurance across all their uh, insurance products and were able to save about 450 a year. And so you can see uh, from our cases, there's a wide range of ways that a captive insurance company can help businesses. Many businesses may be the types of clients that you're working with now. So. Uh, you know, a captive insurance company and the other strategies that we covered, frankly, are a great place for you to give your clients the green light, if you will, to implement strategies to keep assets in play. So if you'd like a copy of the slides, uh, just ask uh, Tom or me. Here's our emails, uh, and you can certainly call us as well to send you the slides. Just request a copy. We'll be glad to send them to you. And we'll be glad to answer any more questions. We've got a few more minutes. If you uh, want to ask a question, you can certainly unmute and ask it, or you can put it in the chat box. Very good. Well, um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. If we can help you in any way, whether it's referring you to a cost mitigation firm, uh, defined benefit, uh, cash balance plan specialist, uh, help your clients set up and own their own insurance company. Uh, just reach out, Tom and I will be uh, more than happy to help you and uh, honored to uh, work with you in the future. So everybody have a uh, fantastic uh, rest of your day. All right, goodbye.